The information provided in this podcast is educational and not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Dr. Donnie Wilson struggled for decades to solve her numerous health issues and heal her body. But with focused determination, she healed herself. And in doing so, she discovered the Dr. Donnie Stress Recovery Protocol. On this show, you're going to hear from doctors, nutritionists, and experts, along with Dr. Donnie, who will give practical advice and wisdom to help heal your body. This is how humans heal. Hi, and welcome. I am very excited to introduce you to Dr. Carrie Jones today. She is a naturopathic doctor and has also a master's in public health and is the medical director at Precision Analytical, which is the lab that has created and offers what we know of as the Dutch urine hormone test. So welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for being here with, us, with me today. Thank you, Dr. Donnie. When you, I was so excited because you and I have known each other for a while. So I was really, you know, pretty thrilled when you reached out about your podcast. Oh, and you know, you and I both love to talk about and think about hormones and understanding the body, right? And like Absolutely. how do all these hormones work? What are they up to? I mean, what, by the way, what got you headed in this direction in your life? <laughs> I grew up wanting to go, I wanted to be a conventional either pediatrician or OBGYN. And I actually got sort of disillusioned with their approach to medicine. And so I was in the, in, I was in Ohio and I moved to the West coast. I moved to Oregon, to Portland, Oregon, found naturopathic medicine and went, Oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I continued on though in gynecology and hormones and you know endocrinology with a naturopathic uh, spin to it. Did my residency in hormones and women's health, and it's just continued because I find so many women, as you do, struggle with hormonal imbalance, and then their partners oftentimes get sent in too because you know we help them, and they're like, "Can you help my partner? Can you help my husband, my wife?" We're like, "Yeah, absolutely." And so hormone imbalance seems to be pretty rampant and it's, um, it can be tricky to understand, as you know, if you don't do it day in and day out. And so I just love it. I love the, um, I love to explain and to educate like you. And so that's what kept me, kept me in it. Oh, that's, it's, it's awesome. And, and like you're saying, I mean, for a, for a long time, we didn't have this test. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been practicing for 20 years and for most of that time, if I wanted to understand a patient's hormones, I would need to do a blood test. Or an, and of course, we still, of course, look at a patient's symptoms and what's going on in their body and how they're feeling. So, but before we had to do a, a much more rely on that mm -hmm. because this test doesn't, didn't exist. And so I always, each day, I'm so grateful mm -hmm. that the Dutch test exists because it's so valuable. And so I want to talk more about that today. Like, why is this test so valuable? Who would it benefit? You know, if you're listening, um, so that you understand, like, could this be a test that would be helpful for you in solving the mystery of your health or the mystery of your hormones? Because they really, like you said, they can feel like a mystery. And I think it's because I mean, part of that is kind of the sense of medicine is, you know, that, that it almost feels like our bodies are mysteries. But you know, as you and I know, when you really get down to it and understand the science, it doesn't have to be such a mystery. We can actually understand the biochemistry, understand how these hormones relate to each other, and then we can implement uh, dietary changes, nutrients, herbs that can actually help rebalance these hormones. So I always say I like to do tests where we can do something about the results. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I love this test is because it gives us information we can do something with. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. hundred percent. Yep. Now, like before, when we wanted to test estrogen, progesterone, let's say we would do a say 24 hour urine. Now some practitioners will still do 24 hour urine, but that's a pain to try to collect your urine for 24 hours. It's and hard enough to, you know, get our lunch in and <laughs> get it <laughs> sleep, let alone collect urine for 24 hours, you know? So that's one of the key differences here is that we're talking about a urine test for hormones, but you don't have to do a 24 hour urine. You're doing what they call dried urine samples. Maybe talk that, talk that through, like how was it that that was even developed as a, a possibility and, and what kind of difference that makes? Yeah. When, so 
as you said earlier, so blood testing is sort of what obviously started first. It's We still use it all the time. It's gold standard for a lot of different markers. And then what happened is we wanted to test cortisol more. So then saliva testing became really popular because mm-hmm. nobody wanted to get their blood drawn four or five times in the day. That sounded awful. So, we cre- so saliva was created to still give you hormone markers like estrogen and progesterone, but also be able to do it at home and give you throughout the day measurements, cortisol mm-hmm. throughout the day, because you could spit in a tube and that's you know, pretty straightforward. But then what happened was we have 24 hour urine, like you're saying, but research has to- shown us that a lot of people miss one or two of their collections in that 24 hours. You know, if you have to pee really bad and you're at work and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to get my jug. It's That's tough. awkward. Like <laughs> I'm going to go and hope for the best. And so it's not a true 24 hour or you're at home or, you know, like this, like a lot can happen to get in the way. So yeah. the creator of the Dutch test, uh, Mark Newman came up with dried urine. So instead of collecting in a big orange jug all day, you, you, the, you urinate on these pieces of filter paper four or five times during the day. Even simpler than saliva, because there's no spitting. And a lot of women especially have maybe urinated on a pregnancy test or an ovulation predictor kit. And so we're kind of used to, we've peed in a cup before. And so it's pretty straightforward. And you just pee on these little strips in the morning, two hours later, around dinner, before bed. And if you have insomnia in the middle of the night, let them dry, that's the dried part and then mail them back to the lab. And so it's pretty easy collection um, that a lot of people you know, understand. Now the bonus, the bonus of it being urine is that you get all your hormones that you're used to, estradiol, estrone, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, but we then give you what are called metabolites, which are basically a fancy word for pathways. So you get estrogen, but where is it going? Estrogen goes through three steps to get through detoxification. The Dutch test gives you step one and step two. You have testosterone and you want to understand if that's the reason you have acne on your jawline or baldness at your temples or hair growth in places you don't want. But if your testosterone is normal, let's say in the blood work, and yet you still have all the symptoms, Doing the urine testing gives you that extra added information of, oh, my testosterone is normal, but what I make is going down the pathway that causes acne and hair loss and all this stuff. And so you get this extra, like an, like an onion. We just peel away the top part and we're like, okay, here's where it's going because those pathways are active and can cause symptoms. And we can pick up on that in the urine in a way that we don't, we can't get in a blood test because I, I still do see that. Like a lot of patients will um, be having their doctors monitoring. And of course, yes, you can do, you know, say with estrogen, a quick or cortisol, you know, or testosterone, you can do a blood test, but you're going to get just that moment in time. Yep. Whereas you're saying like with cortisol, it, I think it's the only hormone that starts out, it should be higher in the morning and gradually decreases through the day. So if you only have your blood drawn in the morning, you're not going to know what the rest of the day looks like. Right. As, uh, doctor, as Dr. Stephanie Estima says, so blood testing is like a snapshot, a picture, whereas the urine hormone testing gives you, it's like a video. You can just get mm-hmm. more context, more movement, more information to pull it all together, and uh, which is which is nice, and it's because nobody wants to get their blood drawn as soon as they wake up, and, and then right before you go to bed, like you would have to go to a lab, get your blood drawn, come home, and it like that it doesn't work that way. And I find too that the reference ranges are off. Like when we're looking at a reference range for estrogen, often in the blood work, the reference range is really broad. So mm-hmm. it's easy to fall in the normal range, right. and then you it, it ends up being dismissed you know, a lot of times like, well, it's in the normal range. But when, when we look at say estrogen and these other hormones on the Dutch panel, you're that you guys give it to us on the report, like a little speedometer. And so we can see this nice range and we can see it relative to the other hormones. So you're getting more of a dynamic look at the hormone level instead of just this, oh, you're in the reference range kind of a look. And we also give on it for the uh, estrogen markers and for the progesterone, we also give you a menopausal range, which is important to know if you are menopausal, you can hear my dog barking. Mm-hmm. Hi, doggy. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, um, so we give you, so you, it's important to know if you are menopausal, but it's also important to know if you're not menopausal, 
but you're in that range. And then I can say to somebody, you're in the menopausal range, but yet you're 27. You know, this is not right. We need to figure this out and get you out of that menopausal range. So it is a good um, visual for a lot of women. And and even men, when they look at their testosterone, we give you ranges, but also age ranges. So when you have a man, he can see like, ooh, I'm way lower than I should be, or I'm right where I should be. And it's a nice visual for him. I mean, I really see that that makes a difference in practice when patients can actually see what's going on with their hormones in their body, because we're so used to kind of being in this you know, ambiguous space of wondering what's going on and not really knowing and seeing a lot of practitioners that are not really giving us answers. And here's a test that can just kind of turn the lights on, so to speak. And you just can see, oh, that's where my levels are. And like you said, you can see the metabolites too, where you can see how are those hormones being processed. I mean, a lot of times I I, I like to clarify, like you would think that all we would care about would be the production of estrogen, mm -hmm. but no, in the case of estrogen, the exit pathway yeah. of estrogen is, is also huge. Like you might have completely normal production of estrogen, but if it's not exiting in a smooth fashion, mm -hmm. that can cause a lot of symptoms. So I just want to transition a bit and talk about like, what are some of the, um, You've already mentioned some of the health issues that this test can help. Um, in terms of, and we'll, let's, we'll come back to men as well, but for women, um, like along these lines, if we can look at the detoxification pathways, I mean, I that can definitely help. I mean, one of the areas I specialize in is helping women who have HPV and abnormal pap smears. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, a lot of the research around that can relate to how those women are metabolizing estrogen. Yes. Now, for a long time, we would just give DIM, which is a, a, you know, broccoli, a substance from broccoli extract that help metabolize estrogen. But I find if we can do this panel, mm -hmm. then I can find out for this particular woman, is that part of the issue that's causing her to be susceptible to HPV and abnormal pap smears. So I can really dial in her protocol mm -hmm. based on her hormones and her detoxification pathways. Right. Have Did you seen that too? A mm -hmm. lot less, potentially a lot less supplements, where is um, if you are a woman or even a man and you're struggling with estrogen issues and your practitioner is just like, oh, here's Here's what I, you know, like Dan, like here's all the supplements I know that, you know, gets rid of estrogen out of the body. Here's liver support. Here's all this, you know, but when you, when you test, I can actually, cause I said there's three steps. So if you know which step is broken or slow, or maybe you have all three, but if it's just one step, then I'm like, oh, we just need to hone in right here. Like the, here's the step we need to hone in. I don't need to work on step one and we don't need to work on step three. It's step two or or whatever it is. And I think it's, it's so really much more it's, and it's worth it's, the cost of the test because you right. yeah, you're saving, you're not spending all this money on extra supplements that you, you may not even need for your for your body, right? right. And it, sometimes they can make you worse. So we're trying to be individualized, right? We're trying to cater to the person and what they're going through. Um, and in some cases though, people mistakenly think like, well, is it possible you can have too much detox? I'm like, you can. Mm -hmm because you want all the steps to be open. But if you are, if you are just gearing up, ramping up the first step as fast as possible, as hard as possible, because you don't know any better, mm -hmm. but your step two and your step three are clogged or slow, then your step one just builds up and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up and it has nowhere to go. Right. So just like a bathtub that's about to overflow, it's still going to, you know, you're going to get water everywhere and ruin your bathroom and ruin the floor. It does the same in your body. You have to be very careful. So so I say to people, you can maybe get away with it for a little while, but the body is going to push back. And I've had so many women that will say that like, that was me. Like I was taking all this estrogen support thinking, I just read it online. I read a blog article about it. I saw it on Instagram and I was taking all this stuff and I started to feel worse. Like I started, like it, like it helped for a minute and then like, oh, I got so much worse. Yeah. That happened to me. Oh my gosh. I, I was, you know, I wish this test existed way back then when I was really struggling because, you know, I was the one where they're like, oh, just take all these B vitamins and herbs for the liver. And I was worse. <laughs> and I was like, I, can't, I didn't know what to do then, yeah. you know, but if this test had existed, it would have made a big difference. Then I would have been able to see, oh, 
this is where the slowdown is or the traffic jam. And now I can address that specifically. Yeah. It's like menopausal women. Menopausal women already have lower levels of estrogen because they're in heading into menopause or menopausal. Mm -hmm. And then they do all this estrogen clearing stuff. And some of it like dim will lower estrogen out of circulation. So I would have menopausal or perimenopausal mm -hmm. women say to me, well, I read this blog about dim and I took a bunch of dim and now I'm having hot flashes and night sweats and my joints hurt and brain fog. I'm like, well, you're clearing your estrogen out way too fast. Like you sped up the, the process. We have to, we have to, we approach it differently when you're perimenopausal and menopausal. So you can do more harm than good. No, it's so true. And I've really now come to recommending that anyone who's perimenopausal, even, you know, postmenopausal, especially if you're thinking about doing hormone replacement, this test is essential, I would say on at least an annual basis. Right. Because right. then, because we want to also help with the meta metabolism of these estrogens in order to prevent breast cancer. Right. right. Yeah. Or at least lower the risk, right? Mitigate, mitigate the risk as best as we can, as best as we know how. Yeah. Because these, these, um, I mean, I, I hear you because it's, of course, with breast cancer, there's so many possible variables and contributors, but one that we can, you know, pay attention to, um, based on this test is the metabolism of the estrogens. And if estrogens, Sometimes I describe it like there's these three path possible pathways in the in this in the phase one of detoxification, and that's influenced. What your body's going to do is influenced by your genetics, and it's influenced by your stress exposure and your toxin exposure. But you don't know, so the only way to know is to do this test and see, hey, how am I metabolizing estrogens? Is it going down a pathway that's going to be more toxic and potentially damaging to DNA or cells and and, um, and then if you know that, that, again, I don't know who, I don't know if you know who the amazing, brilliant person is who figured out broccoli extract and sulforaphane. Sulforaphane, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Who would think that this substance in broccoli, I mean, there's dim we talked about from broccoli, but there's also sulforaphane from broccoli sprouts. And it helps with protecting us from these toxic estrogen metabolites. I mean, that, right? Like when you think about it, it's like, how did they, how did they figure that out over any other substance? But somehow right. they figured yeah. that out. Yeah. So we can use a natural substance to help protect ourselves. But knowing that you need that to begin with, we can see in this urine test. Yeah, absolutely. I took my sulforaphane this morning. Usually I have, I either take it or I grow my own sprouts. I've, um, started doing that, which is so much fun. And so, uh, which is, and so women will say, can I just, can I eat, can I eat my way to help? And I'm like, in some regards you can, you can grow broccoli sprouts, not the full broccoli stalk, you know, that you would florets and stuff, but the sprouts. And I said, you can totally grow organic broccoli sprouts and, you know, chew them, chop them, put them in your smoothies and your salads, eat them as a snack, you know, like you can absolutely eat your way to improving your estrogen and, and getting that sulforaphane. Yeah, it's that's amazing, and I and definitely if if anyone's listening who's um, using any kind of hormone replacement therapy, whether oral or transdermal or even vaginal um, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, this test is essential because it's such a great way to monitor your doses and right. to right to make sure you're in a safe range. And, to, and the fact that this test can be done while you're using hormones, like some tests. If you just say did blood work, it might show your estrogens high, but that's just because you're taking the hormones. It's not very helpful for fine tuning the dose. Yeah. And where it's going, right? Where maybe it's, I mean, it might be high because you're taking it, but it may also be high because you can't get it out. So it's just recirculating. And so that's nice. You're left with question marks, but with this test, it's eliminating those question marks. Right. Right. Helps you fine tune more. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, so I think that that's a, that's a really important time for the test, but I also use this test for, um, for definitely for PMS, PMDD, PCOS mm -hmm. and fertility. Mm -hmm. Um, did I tell you that it's, I've seen this happen several times. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when a patient does the test somehow, just the fact of doing the test, they're more likely to get pregnant. I, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a joke sometimes for, for women. They'll, 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 
Yep. They'll spend the money. They'll get the test. they will be mid collection. They'll collect, they'll mail it in. And then we'll get this call, you know, my gosh, I found out I'm pregnant. Like, can you not run the test yet? Or can you hold it? Yeah. <laughs> well, because it's, I think sometimes it's the intention, you know, like now you're paying attention to the days of the month. And when you're ovulating, because when you're doing a test, say with someone who's menstruating or in a for, you know, fertility, we would collect usually about day 20. Right. I think of it, which is after ovulation. So mm-hmm. you kind of have to know when will I ovulating? When yeah. am I going to collect the test? And so I think maybe just bringing attention to it makes it a little more likely you're going to conceive. Right. Um, but, um, but I, you know, even without that um, interesting little thing that can happen, um, it can make such a big difference in fertility just to, again, understand. I mean, you also offer a cycle mapping mm-hmm. option too, right? Tell, tell us about that. That's what probably my favorite test for a woman who is cycling, especially if she's having symptoms throughout her month. So a lot of women will say, you know, I have symptoms close to my period, but other women will go, I have symptoms around ovulation or I'm very, you know, I have symptoms on day eight and day 10 and day 13, but it's hard. You don't want to blood test all of those days. I mean, that's a lot. So Mm -hmm. we offer the cycle mapping, which is where you do one urine test every morning, pretty much every morning of your cycle. And then we graph it out for you. So we see the hopeful rise and fall of estrogen and the rise and and fall of progesterone. And then we can look for patterns. We can see what's going on. Like, okay, here's where it seems to be the issue or wow, you're not really making that much progesterone. Wow. Your estrogen's not getting high enough prior to ovulation. Um, And we can also, for that cycle, we can tell somebody when they ovulated, which is because we can see um, after ovulation is when progesterone rises. And so I can say, oh, this month, it looks like you ovulated on this day. Um, And sometimes they're like, I had no idea, or that's not what I thought at all. You know, I thought I ovulated earlier. I thought I ovulated later. Um, I'm like, well, for this one month, I can tell you what you did. And so it can give just that sort of macroscopic overview for people. Something a lot of people don't know is that too much stress can actually create an abundance of health problems like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, anxiety, migraines, insomnia, even fertility issues. This is because high stress puts your adrenal glands on overload. They release cortisol and adrenaline, which controls your digestion, hormones, immune system, energy, focus, and even your emotional response. So how can you beat stress when you don't know where to start? That's why we have a free seven-day stress reset program. It's designed to help support weight loss, digestive healing, and hormone balancing. It includes support for integrating self-care, daily tips come to you by email and video, gluten-free, dairy-free meal plans, as well as grocery shopping lists, journal pages, and more. This free program will help you beat stress and put you on the path to wholeness in your body. Get your plan now for free at drdonnie.com. I mean, that's, uh, again, it's, it can be so helpful, I think, to just be able to see it and to have that validation and then to, um, and then to be able to have help, you know, like from a practitioner who can now guide you, you know, to, um, I love how you were talking recently about the ovaries and how the ovaries work and, you Mm -hmm. know, um, and, you know, about even the mitochondria. Um, we can talk about uh, mitochondria in the ovaries and mitochondria in the adrenal glands, but um, give us a little bit of that, you know, <laughs> carry, carry science on the carry science. Uh, well, what I was talking about the ovaries is I, um, a lot of women don't realize that there's, we have, we have two kinds of cells on our ovaries. So on all our ovaries, we have all sorts of follicles. That's what contains the egg. And when it's, it's the follicles start to grow, we have a set of cells that make like testosterone. And then we have a set of cells that take that testosterone and magically convert it into estrogen. So these two cells make two different hormones, but they rely on each other. Wow. Once you ovulate, once you release the egg, those two cells magically convert like Cinderella into mm-hmm. a third type of cell called lutein cells or your corpus luteum. That, that group of cells makes progesterone. So women will often write me and I'm sure they write you and they say, what, what supplement can I take to ovulate better or to make progesterone? I'm like, well, you have to go back, hmm. you know, cause it takes, it takes two cells to make a third cell. So you have to go back and you have to support hmm. the cells that make testosterone because then you have to support the cells that make estrogen and those two become the cells that make progesterone. So you actually have to support yourself your whole month 
if you're trying to just affect what happens in the last half of the month. And I think that really um, surprises women that it's that the magic happens in a domino effect, in a cascade effect. You have to have one before you can have the other. Now in the cell though, right in the cell themselves, where these hormones are made are in the mitochondria. So we all learned in high school, the mitochondria are cellular powerhouses and they absolutely are. They make our energy, our ATP, but our hormones start here. So the first step to everything is in the mitochondria. Then everybody leaves and goes over to the, what are called the endoplasmic reticulum. And then you become progesterone, you graduate, you mature into progesterone, mature into testosterone, right? Estrogen. And then you go out in circulation. Cortisol is different. Cortisol comes back into the mitochondria and finish, finishes its graduation in back in the mitochondria. Mm. So mitochondria are super important to start your hormone production and then to end your cortisol production. And mitochondria are fragile little beings. They're really powerful, but they're really fragile. They don't like chemicals. They don't like to get damaged, right? They don't like in environmental toxic, uh, toxicants. They don't like it when you're... Um, not moving. They like when you move, they like oxygen. So they don't like when you snore and they don't like if you have sleep apnea and they don't like if you're a mouth breather, they like things like red light. Um, so people you'll, you know, a lot of people are in a red light therapy now. Mm -hmm. They like cold. They, they, um, help like cold showers, cold plunges. Some people are into cryotherapy, which is those little sort of cold machines. You'll see it biohacker clinics and whatnot to help, to help uh, fortify them and, and stimulate them. Um, they like exercise and weight training. So there's a lot of things they like and a lot of things they don't like. And so if we can, if we can err on the things they like and avoid the things they don't like, then it can really help hormone production. I, I love that, you know, because it, it also, all of what you were just saying really brings us back to realizing how interconnected our bodies are, mm -hmm. you know, cause sometimes you figure that like the, because we're talking about a menstrual cycle that it's all located in the pelvic area or that it's, you know, that it's only that time of the month, but it's actually like everything that we do every day is going to influence these mitochondria and it's going to influence ovary function and, and for men going to in, influence testes function too. And it's the same for men. It, our men testosterone is made in the mitochondria. So the same thing apply to them as well. Um, when it comes to testosterone production. And with men, as you know, uh, it's like sleep. Like sleep is critically important for women for a lot of reasons, but for men, for testosterone production, there is a, a, a small research study, but it's still a research study on humans. And they took men, um, I want to say it was nine men, but it could have been even, I think it was nine. Anyway, so a small study, but still they shortened their amount of sleep to five hours. They just, they just kept them at five hours of sleep. And they found that over a very quick period of time, their testosterone production went down. And I was wow. like, I know a lot of men that only get five hours. I know a lot of men that are up gaming. I know a lot of men who are entrepreneurs and up late. I know a lot of men who can't sleep. I know a lot of men who are on their phone, on their computer, on their tablet, on their TV, they're sucked into Netflix. Men who are working second shifts, uh, second, um, second shift, right? So they're, they're up later and then going to bed, but maybe they have to get up in the morning. So they really are only surviving on five hours of sleep. And it's going to, if it's not currently, it's over time going to affect your testosterone and, um, and it's sleep, you know, everyone's like, Oh, give me testosterone. What herb can I take? What nutrient can I take? You know, what can I do to like pump up my testosterone? I'm like, you just told me you get four hours of sleep every night. Like start there. That's where it's made. It's made when you sleep. It's not made in the day. It's made when you sleep. Wow. Yeah. That's something. I mean, and just eye-opening to think what a difference we can make with our hormones with, with yeah, just Basically. getting that seven and a half hours of sleep. Yes. And I, I love to, like, I've been really trying to get myself, I see you all the time with your blue light blocking glasses on um, to help with your melatonin production at night. Um, but, um, you know, I've been trying to get myself to go to bed earlier because of trying to get, give myself more time for deep sleep, which happens more in that before First 3 p.m. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. earlier in the in the night. So but that's my challenge. I tend to want to get more stuff done before I go to sleep and I have to be like, no Donnie, you need yeah. to go to bed. <laughs> which, which is the um it's the entrepreneur and it's the parent curse, so to speak, right? The entrepreneurs yeah. and parents, um it's 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 the second wind, right? Their kids go to sleep or they've had dinner and they've 
you know, they're like, okay, now I need to get the rest of this stuff done. I'm going to get back on my computer. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to knock this off my checklist before I go to bed. And it winds them up. And for a lot of people, then it, they struggle to wind back down and they, they don't sleep nearly as well as they think they do, or they struggle to fall asleep, or they wake up early because they're, you know, their mind is going again. They're, they were stimulated too late. And so I'm equally as guilty. I mean, don't get me wrong, um, <laughs> but it is hard. It is hard trying to retrain like, hey, look, in the evening, I do need you to wind down an hour or two before bed. I need you to get off your computer. I need you to, you know, not be, so, even, even with all the, um, everything happening in 2020, you know, Netflix and, you know, Amazon prime and whatever, everybody's up watching sh all these shows because their work from home, their kids are home, everybody's home. And what are they, what, what are they watching? They're watching like murder mystery stuff, you know, like yeah. all these shows that came out that were, yeah. you know, kind of, they're like, who done it and solve it. And you know, all these crazy things. That's what my daughter and, wants to watch. Yeah. And, then, and they're like, I can't sleep. I'm like, of course you can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> And you're reminding me that this panel, your your panel, I've found it very helpful for my patients with insomnia who've been trying to solve insomnia because yes, we can look at the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, but we can also measure melatonin levels in the urine. And let's talk more about melatonin and cortisol. Yeah. So melatonin is like the moon and cortisol is like the sun. So we want melatonin at night and we want cortisol in the day. And so melatonin is Believe it or not, it's primarily made in, well, you know this, it's made in your gut, but it's the pineal gland that um, up in our brain that makes melatonin that helps with our, um, what we call a circadian rhythm. So uh, up in the morning, down at night, light, dark, it's that light, dark cycle. So when melatonin starts to come out, what, at about an hour or two before your average bedtime. So, you know, so if you go to bed at, let's say between 10 and 11, your melatonin is starting to come out around eight or 9 p.m. And it generally starts to come out when it gets darker and dimmer. Therefore, at night, we want to dim our lights. We don't want bright lights. We don't want blue lights. We don't want, you know, our 55-inch screen TV <laughs> showing us the scary movie that's bright and flickering because that tells the brain, be active, mm -hmm. keep cortisol up, right? And so mm -hmm. melatonin goes... <sighs> okay, <laughs> it gets suppressed and cortisol stays up and then we struggle with sleep. So we need melatonin. It's it to, it, melatonin is our onset sleep hormone. So to fall asleep, not necessarily to stay asleep. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling to fall asleep, then you are the person who is going to need the blue light blocking glasses and you will need to get off your phone or your computer or TV about an hour or two before bed. You're going to need to like, wind down. Give the signals to your body yeah. and your brain yeah for the behavior that you want it to do, you know? Exactly. exactly. Read a real book, not your tablet, you know, and, you know, or, or med do some meditation, journal, talk to your family, you know, do, do easy stuff around the house. You know, like a lot of times as I'm like getting ready to go to bed, you know, I may, um, you know, like clean, you know, like, or not organize like extra. I'm trying to think of the word I like putter, like I putter around my house, you know, <laughs> I like put the, the piles together and, you know, I like refold. Yeah, this is one more thing. I've been I know, and, but it's just, it's just like numb my, it's just, it's an easy routine for me. Like I'm going to, I make tea. I just get, like I set my stuff out for the next day. I let my dog out at night, you know, like I kind of just have these yeah. slow routine stuff that I do to get ready <laughs> for the next day and wind down, come upstairs for bed. Um, but I'm not, I mean, I am, I have been guilty of, don't get me wrong, but I'm not like rushing to finish stuff on the computer and then, you know, like paying bills and getting stressed out. And I don't have every light on in the house. Now my husband loves all the lights on in the house and it drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. And then he can't figure out why he can't sleep. I'm like, because you have <laughs> bright light all the time. So mm -hmm. we are, we are compromising on that routinely. So, mm -hmm. so as I tell people, I'm like, well, tell me about your wind down routine. And it's, mm -hmm. don't you find it so amazing when people. Yeah stop and think like, what do I do before bed? Oh my gosh. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm kind of a crazy person and, and do, running around and stressing out and doing this. And, and it's way harder for the mamas, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, um, dissing the, the, you know, dads, but for like the moms tend to be the caretakers. And so mm -hmm. now with school at home, <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot where moms are like, Oh crap. You know, I have two kids or three kids That's or four kids. kids and I'm, done. It's, yeah. it's more on their plate and their home. You can't send them off to school to get stuff done in your day. And, and maybe you're also running a business or working or you're working from home. And, and so it's a lot. And so they use that time at night to 
get no, I'm finding it to be a really important time to do this panel because, mm -hmm. because the stress has shifted and our life, our daily routines have shifted. And um, interestingly, the patients of mine who've been working with me for a while and we've we worked on like maybe in the past they had a low melatonin or high cortisol at night and they corrected it mm -hmm. and you know through our work together and then now with all these different things changing they'll call me and they're like oh my gosh Donnie I can feel it happening again mm -hmm. and we recheck and sure enough we can see that cortisol going up and and um and so we go in the evening, right? So we can talk about that more. Like when, if we see cortisol high in those evening samples, we know that your body's trying to help you out to, to deal with something. Because as, normally as that melatonin goes up, the cortisol goes down. Like you said, I like how you said that, the, the moon and the, and the sun. Think about yeah, I've been saying that for years and years and years. Cortisol is like the sun, melatonin is like the moon. Yeah. But, but you can force flip it. You know, you can, you can, um, you yeah. can mess it up. <laughs> you can, you can force your cortisol to, to be sunny and keep going, you know, but then you're, you're going to struggle. You're not going to sleep. And then, then a lot of times it's, you know, you're waking up in the morning tired because now, cause you really, we want our cortisol to be high in the morning. Talk about the cortisol awakening response. Cause that we can also see in your panel, right? You can see it in the panel. And what's even better is that much like the wind down routine we've been talking about, addressing the cortisol awakening response is oftentimes free or very cheap. And this is what people like. They want things that they can actively input into their lifestyle that doesn't cost a lot of money and is pretty easy to do. So first, let me start with what it is. We call it the car, the cortisol awakening response. So when you are in bed, mm -hmm. as you get closer to your wake up time, your brain is telling your adrenal glands like now, can we make cortisol now, 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 mm -hmm. right? Like it's on Christmas yeah. now presence now. And the adrenals are like, no, not yet. Not yet. He or she hasn't opened their eyes. Once you open your eyes, cause your alarm went off or whatever light comes in light tells you, you know, like, Oh, it's morning light comes in and your brain goes now. And the adrenals make a lot of cortisol very quickly in normal amounts. Everyone's like, hi, cortisol. That's bad. It's supposed to go up like a mountain very quickly in 30 minutes, you hit this peak and then it starts to decline. Why does it go up very quickly to a peak in 30 minutes? Because in 30 minutes, think about um, caveman days. Think about survival. You wake up in the morning and the body's like, all right, I need to get you alert. I need to reduce your inflammation. I need to help you get going. I need to get your butt out of bed because you could get eaten. Mm -hmm. And I need to help your blood sugar management because you've been fasting all night. And I don't know when you're going to eat breakfast or if you're going to eat breakfast. That's what it does. It's all protective. It's all normal. It's all important for the body. Love it. I love so that. we have a cheater question. This is my cheater question. I've been asking forever. How long does it take you to get going in the morning? How long does it take you to feel alert? Right. Most mm. people tell me, well, it takes me about two hours and two cups of coffee. And I'm like, well, your awakening response kicks off in 30 minutes. So I know you have a low, slow awakening response and you're reliant on coffee. Whereas other people say, well, I wake up stressed out. I wake up mm -hmm. anxious. I wake up hypervigilant. I wake up with my heart racing. Like, okay, your mountain is a little too high. You yeah. do go up to Kilimanjaro as opposed to where I live. We have like Mount Hood, which is, yes. you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. better where your parents live, right? Mount Bachelor. So we like a more, a better mountain. So um, we, we want you to be in an appropriate healthy range. And the great thing is, all of this is dependent on, what did I say? Light. Yeah. Light. And so what I tell people is when you wake up, don't grab your phone. Not that light. <laughs> we want full spectrum light. We want sunlight. We want a full spectrum light box. We want a full spectrum alarm clock. So open your blinds. Open your window. Get this. Oh, just knock my table. Open, mm -hmm. you know, go outside for a couple minutes. Don't look at the sun. Let's not blind ourselves and burn the retina. Mm -hmm. But get, just go outside for a couple minutes, get some of that sunshine in. And if you wake up and it's still dark out, consider buying like a 20 or $30 light box on Amazon. I have no affiliation. I just got online and found one that I liked. Some people like them that clip to their computer. Some like them that stand on like a box, that stand on their desk. I have that kind. My best friend has the alarm clock kind. So as her alarm, as her wake up time gets closer, it starts the the full spectrum light starts to glow and fill the room. So everyone's different. So I say do that in the morning and that can really help 
stimulate an appropriate response. And it can take a couple weeks to reset yourself, but man, the feedback I get from people, I've been lecturing about the awakening response for years now. Um, and the feedback I get from people is, wow, since I've started implementing that, I, like I didn't even think, I just grabbed my phone in the morning and now I open my blinds or I sit outside, it, you know, especially in the summer. Like it makes a huge difference. I'm like, I know. And the why, because people are like, well, why? Um, so we have these genes in our brain called appropriately called clock genes, like mm -hmm. your clock on your wall, right? And they help us determine our rhythms in our day. So they help us figure out morning, noon, and night. It helps how our body kicks off in a rhythm. They are very, 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 very triggered and reset and censored by light and dark. They're not they're not asking for ashwagandha. They're not asking for B vitamins. They're not asking for sugar, right? They're not asking for HIIT training. They're asking for light and dark. So I'm like, well, give them what they want. Give the genes what they want. They want light in the morning and dark at night. And so, and that's that. pretty free really, and expensive. It really is amazing when you think about, you know, how our bodies are so responsive and, and yeah, it can be, it doesn't have to be that complicated. But the thing is, is just, prioritizing it, right? To realize, oh, this is going to make a difference. Now, how do I prioritize that in my day to make that purchase? And when I wake up to remember to make that decision. Um, and, um, but I, I think that's, it's so amazing to just also see how our bodies are so responsive to nature and our surroundings, yeah. you know, and to, to just realize that, to go, wow, light and darkness also has a, plays a role with the ovaries and ovulation. Hundred percent, and I tell people even our our bigger cortisol circadian rhythm. So up in the morning, down at night, that rhythm is our master rhythm. Um, those clock genes are our master rhythm. Mm. We call it the pacemaker. And so every single other gland in your body has baby clock genes in them, mini clock genes in them, and they all they all um, like answer to the main clock genes in your brain. So I tell women, if your cycle is really irregular or off, or you're not feeling it, the rhythm is crazy, how is your actual rhythm? Are you sleeping? Are you, are you using light in the morning and dark at night? Because if your main rhythm is working, it just helps more all the rhythms underneath it, including your ovarian rhythm, your ovulation rhythm, your period rhythm. And now, now in 2020, I'm sure you are getting the same feedback I'm getting is women are going, Carrie, what is wrong with my cycle? Yeah, I, I didn't ovulate, or I'm I, I'm four days early. I'm seven days late. I skipped June. I've never skipped a cycle. Yeah, and your rhythm is completely off. Twenty twenty is like, can we just hit do over? That would be yeah. <laughs> our sleep is off. Our stress is through the roof. Everything is different. Our normal is not normal, and so our body's going well. This seems like a threat. I'm not going to make your cycle. Like, why would you, why would I want to actively, you know, help you try to get pregnant? Not that you're trying to get pregnant, but that's the, that's the sensors in the body. Or the woman. Thinking, yeah. Yeah. So what happens is the body's like, Ooh, not this month, no ovulation for you. And this was me. This was me. The month of September. I, my September was very stressful and my body was like, well, no ovulation for you. And I feel it. <laughs> not that I wanted to get pregnant, but I sure wanted my progesterone. I tell you what. And so as a lot of women, if we can, so I'm working very hard to keep my master rhythm. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, try, I'm try, we were talking beforehand, like I'm trying to go to bed at a decent hour. I'm trying to wear my, I'm wearing my blue light blocking glasses at night. I'm okay. winding down and I'm getting up and I'm going outside with my dog or I'm using my full spectrum light box because if I set that rhythm, I'm hoping I will calm my nervous system and then retrain my reproductive rhythm. Oh, I love, I love, and I love how you share, you know, from, you know, what you're doing and, and showing people that, you know, that it's doable to integrate these things into yeah. your life pattern and, and that it can make a difference and that you can then see the difference in these test results, you know, and to be able to have, you know, that test that can give you, you know, that feedback and validation so that you know you're you're on the right track. Um, by the way, I always I always joke because you know, you we refer to it as a Dutch test, like, you know, and, and I always say to people, this has nothing to do with the Netherlands, although that would be fine <laughs> if it was, but it actually comes from Oregon. Um, but do, do people say that a lot of times? <laughs> All the time. And it's even funny when we go to conference before when we were allowed to go to conferences, 
um, especially international conferences where Dutch people would go, are you testing <laughs> Dutch heritage? I'm like, no, it's an acronym, dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, this is the test we're talking about is the Dutch test, but that's, yes, the dried urine test. Yeah. And it's, and you can, we can do different, we can do either just the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, or we can do just cortisol. DHEA is another adrenal hormone, or we can do all of those hormones. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a panel that, um, that I offer through my office and with my patients and, um, and I'm also offering to do um, consultations. So if someone, you know, did this panel somewhere else and they're just needing help to understand what to do with the information or, um, or say you want to just do this particular panel and meet with me to get, you know, what does it mean? What am I supposed to do? What, you know, where do I go from here? Then um, um, I offer that through my, through my practice and I help people all over. I do, I was, I had a virtual practice before 2020, mm -hmm. um, but I continue to offer um, a virtual practice, which is so great because this is, this is a test you can do at home. You can mail it in. You can, we can, you know, easily get the results to you and we can discuss it you know, without you ever even having to leave your house. Right. So it, it's, you know, it's some, it's perfect for this scenario where, you know, so if you're really feeling like, like you were describing the 2020 through your hormones for a loop mm -hmm. and you're like, how am I going to get this all back on track again? Cause the other thing sometimes people kind of wonder is if say we use some of these, even, you know, nutrients or herbs to address hormone imbalance, you know, it almost can seem like, am I masking my hormone function? But I really try to explain to them that it's, our goal is to understand where your body is right now so that we can shift it and that we can actually help the body shift hormone production and hormone balance toward a more optimal range. And then it becomes a matter of how do we maintain that as best as possible over time. And if then if it gets thrown out of balance again, at least now you know what to do, what worked the last time to get it back on balance again. Right, so that when you have this issue again, um, you can go, oh, this feels familiar. I know what to do. This is what Dr. Donnie and I talked about. I'm gonna implement it again. And I highly, we at Dutch highly recommend people work with a practitioner because the full test is six pages long and it's, comprehensive is in the acronym for a reason. Like it is really comprehensive. And we've definitely had people who've maybe ordered it themselves thinking, oh, I understand estrogen or I understand, I've read enough on cortisol to understand it. Um, and our cortisol page is really uh, a lot. We talk about enzymes and we talk about cortisone and we talk about melatonin. We talk about metabolized cortisol, like some things that are not in, um, so, so mainstream on social media and in, in, in blogs and stuff, people stick to cortisol, but they don't get very deep underneath that. And we're pretty deep. And so I, and so then they're like, oh my gosh, I got my test results back. I don't know what to do. Who do you recommend? And so we're constantly referring to practitioners to review it. So I think that's really important to work with someone like yourself who can one, order the tests, decide which one you need. And then, and then what do I do with it once I have the results? Oh, oh, wow. Well, thank you again so much, Carrie, for chatting with me and doing what you do. You share so much information on Instagram and, and I know so people, you know, are enjoying hearing this, the, the science explained by Carrie as much as I do, <laughs> then um, I would encourage them to find you at Instagram. Is there anywhere else you recommend they go to get more information? So they can absolutely, everything we have on Dutch test is free. So Dutch, Dutch test.com. So all of our podcasts like this one, um, all of our videos about uh, the test, everything people, you can don't have to be a practitioner. You can be a practitioner, but you can just watch and, and learn more information, which I think, you know, knowledge is power. Education is power and, and do it. So check out Dutch test.com. Okay. All right. Will do. Oh, thank you again so much. And, um, I appreciate everything you do and for, and, and it's just so wonderful to get to chat with you. So thank you. I know. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Donnie. I, it's great to see your face. <laughs> Thanks for listening to How Humans Heal. If you liked this episode, leave a rating and a review. And for more resources, visit drdonnie.com.